Now I know what you must be thinking. Missing must have taped these stories in December. Because look at me. It's, it's, it's like 92 degrees outside. Humidity is insane. I know that. I got up super early today to get my exercise finished with, you know, before it got so hot. It was still really hot. But then I came in here, and guess what? It's cold. Ah. But I love being here, so it's okay. So I had to put, I even had a red, white, and blue shirt on my Shaler Middle School baseball t-shirt and everything. I bought five of them from my friend Ethan Wally. He made the baseball team this year. But anyway, so it's very cold. So I have my head on. And last night, we heard the beginning of this book right here. Malcolm Little, the boy who grew up by, uh, who grew up to be Malcolm X, and it's by Malcolm X's daughter, Eli, wait, Elisha, Elisha Shabazz. And again, I do apologize for mispronouncing names. I've written it down. I've heard it a hundred times. I saw an excellent interview with her. And she said it herself, and I still can't seem to get it, but, so many apologies. Um, and this is a fantastic book. Uh, when we last left Malcolm, he was fishing with his friend Big Boy, do you remember? And um, they couldn't understand why they weren't getting any bites, right? And so then Malcolm started to get hungry, and he thought, oh, we have to have better bait for our fish, and then they will want to come onto our hook. Fishing, I don't think I can do it. But anyway, so what they were gonna do is, because remember Malcolm imagined the aromas, because he was thinking about when he got home, his mom and dad would have dinner for him and everything, and he was thinking that's what we need. So Malcolm and Big Boy needed to lure the fish to come swimming to their lines. The plastic earthworms were not cutting it. That's what they were using as bait before, plastic earthworms. So the next day, before Malcolm cast his fishing rod into the stream, he pulled a handful of breadcrumbs from his pocket and hurled them into the water, where they landed like raindrops. Soon enough, tiny bubbles appeared around the crumbs, and just like the little children would come rushing to the dinner table each night, the fish swam around to see what treasures Malcolm and Big Boy had to offer. From that day on, the boys caught big, beautiful fish. But more important, Malcolm learned that observation and effort could combine to create desired results. And you can see, he's bringing the fish home that he caught. But the most, the innocent world of magical gardens and carefree fishing would be short-lived, and Malcolm's life would change forever. The young boy, who until now had learned so much from his parents, lost his father Earl to the brute force of racism and the narrow-mindedness of Ku Klux Klan members and their brethren in the Black Legion. They disagreed with Earl and Louise's beliefs in equality, and apparently they also disagreed with Earl's right to live in a free society. In fact, they did not seem to think that he had a right to live at all, and it quickly became clear that the hate and fury that was behind the fire that burned the little house down many years ago was now back again. Only this time, the hate was so strong, it took Earl Little away from his family forever. Louise was left on her own to manage the household and the six acres of land and fend for her children. She sewed, crocheted, and rented out garden space on her land. The two oldest children, Wilfred and Hilda, set out to help their mother with raising the younger siblings and keeping the little family close, close and intact. It was the era of the Great Depression, though, and times got harder and harder. Soon, local officials began to assert that Louise was no longer fit to care for her children, and they threatened to take the, away the family land. The proud, loving mother, on whom the children depended, was now being taken from them for reasons that no one dared to explain. When it rains, it pours, Malcolm once heard his mother say. Now he understood exactly what she meant. When Louise was taken away, the little children became wards of the state. 
all of the brothers and sisters were separated, fortunately, Earl and Louise's good friends welcomed the children with open arms. Without his parents' guidance, Malcolm became disobedient and required the structure of reform school. But due to his academic adeptness, he was eventually enrolled at Mason Junior High School. When he first arrived, he was the only student of color. Malcolm felt like a fish out of water. His brothers and sisters were gone. He missed the sound of his mother's voice. He longed for the passionate speeches his father gave about the teachings of Marcus Garvey. He yearned to hear the gifted orator inspire people to care about history, justice, and equal rights for all mankind. As the only African-American student at his new school, Malcolm would have to blaze his own path toward discovering the remaining truths about his own identity. Malcolm tried to cheer himself up. He would conjure up the sweet and satisfying crunch of his mother's oatmeal cookies after a long day at school and the frenetic clucking of chickens the little family raised and sold, which always sounded like they were arguing. Now, with the memory of their squabbling, provided music to his ears. He thought of how funny Big Boy looked with his pant legs rolled up, sweat pouring down his cheeks like his own private rain shower. Malcolm desperately missed the lively world of laughter and love that he'd grown up in. He thought of his siblings, Wilfred, Hilda, Filbert, Reginald, Yvonne, Wesley, and his newest little brother, Robert, the only other people in the world who must have felt exactly as he did. Malcolm wondered if they went to bed each night longing for the same thing that kept him awake, wanting to be together as a family again. Sad, lonely, and confused, the beautiful colors of his life he once knew flattened into an uninspiring shade of muted gray. The grief was stifling and nothing seemed to help. Malcolm was broken. On one overcast morning, Malcolm stood up from the desk chair and walked over to the open window, which was inviting a soft breeze into his room. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath. And when he opened his eyes again, he saw something he would never forget Hanging delicately from a small twig on a giant evergreen tree was a cocoon, a cocoon, something Louise had showed him one day in the garden. You see that peculiar thing, Malcolm? It's actually a casing spun of silk, a protective covering for the creature that lives inside until it's mature enough to fly out into the world. And just then, with one tiny wing at a time, the magnificent butterfly came half fluttering, half stumbling out. It was in a fight for the very first time, set free. It was in flight for the very first time, set free from its home, alone, and finally face to face with the entire universe. When Malcolm saw the butterfly, that familiar symbol of freedom and transformation, he remembered who he was and where he came from. He remembered his own cocoon, the safe haven where lessons and values came like nourishment each day. With his eyes fixed, he followed the path of that butterfly, flying away. At first, it seemed uncertain, perhaps confused by its new life outside of the safe little shell. But in time, it began to take flight, soaring through the world around it, bringing joy and color everywhere. Can you imagine what, I've never seen a butterfly come out of a cocoon, but I mean, especially like when Malcolm was feeling th this, this desperate um, and lonely to see that happen, what an impact that must have had. The soaring butterfly gently opened Malcolm's heart to feel joy again. Standing there on his own two feet, he felt his roots reaching down into the earth, gripping the soil and providing the strength he needed to awaken the dormant parts of his identity. He would use the sharpness of his mind to overcome the heaviness of his heart. He would replace sadness with smarts and hardship with hard work at school. And just like a butterfly, Malcolm was ready to soar. But his resolve would soon be tested. One morning, the English teacher, Mr. Ostrowski, asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up. 
Malcolm, who was sitting straight up in his chair, proudly announced that he wanted to be a lawyer. His grades were certainly high enough to set him on that path. But his teacher did not believe that African Americans should have high expectations for themselves to aspire or excel. He did not believe that people like Malcolm should dream, hope, plan, or succeed. But Malcolm was now old enough to understand that Mr. Ostrowski, and I'm glad he remembered his name and it's right here. I wonder where you are, Mr. Ostrowski. Anyway, that Mr. Ostrowski was terribly wrong. And just as nothing had ever stopped Earl, Malcolm learned how to rise up with that same bold determination that made his father a family hero. He had good ideas and good friends at school and the can-do attitude to make something of that promising combination. Whenever Malcolm would tell a story or a joke, the kids would all gather round, their eyes fixed on the charismatic boy who was clearly different from them but someone whom they adored and respected just the same. The little boy who had lost so much was now ready to face the world. And then one day, something extraordinary happened. Malcolm Little, the boy who was raised on the vision of freedom and justice, was elected class president by the students in his seventh grade class. When they looked at Malcolm, they no longer saw a mournful lost child lost in the world. Now they saw a smart, insightful, charming winner. They, they voted for a leader who believed in equality and who radiated optimism. Their open-mindedness symbolized hope for generations to come. Malcolm may have lost his family, but he never lost the values for which the little family stood. And for the rest of his life, Whenever doubt, sadness, fear, or pain would come creeping into his thoughts, he would firmly hold on to one constant force that always gave true meaning to his family life, and that was love. And this is the story of a little boy who grew up to be one of the most influential men in America, just as, as his daughter says here at the beginning here. And, and it's just, it's just, pretty it's really inspiring to and i hope it's inspiring to you too and i hope that um if anybody like mr ostrowski has ever said anything to you like well you really can't do that or maybe you want to like aim a little lower or whatever that kind of thing I, I hope instead you will use that to say you know what it's okay i don't need you to support me in that i'm gonna look to those who believe that I can try this and do this. I'm going to look to myself for the gifts that I have and how I can use those in, in, in the right ways. Uh, because like, okay, Mr. Ostrowski said he couldn't do that. But then all of his friends in his class, they were like, oh uh, yeah, like we want you to be president of our class. So just because some people or one person tells you something different, if you know in your heart and you're hearing it from your friends too, and you know it, and your parents are like, dudes, chicky, we're gonna, we're gonna make this happen. You just keep on working and keep on trying. And you, you dream your dreams, my friends, dream your dreams. And the cool thing that I love, the coolest thing, is what, what made him able to do all of these things was he held firmly to the one constant force that always gave true meaning to his family life, and that's love. And you all have that, and you all give that. And so, you got it, you got it. And that is the second half of the story of Malcolm Little's, Malcolm X's childhood. And I thank you, and I hope you're enjoying your Independence Day, and um, as Mr. Asparagus said something this morning, he said, um, he said, we can hope for the day when everybody is independent and free um, from the things that hold them down from being all that they are. And, and, and I hope that happened, is already happening for you, and I hope that it happens for everyone. So thank you so much. Happy Independence Day, my friends. Kiss your beautiful brain. Kiss your loving heart and look in the mirror and say, hey, good looking, because you're all good looking just the way you are.